Um, okay, so uh, I'm talking about the strand line today because um, some of us are still able to get to the beach and if you're not able to get to the beach now, you, I'm sure we'll be darting there the minute we're all able to. Um, <coughs> and um, beaches are absolutely fascinating without actually uh, needing to go into the water whatsoever. Um, the strand line is that thing um, that is um, left on the beach basically after can you see that without I haven't got a can you see the writing mm. on the side yes yes okay, I can't because I've got uh, pictures but that's fine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it um, so that it's the um, basically it's where whatever the tide has brought in whatever it's carrying empty dead life um, from afar or just literally from um, the sea just you know on that beach um, and it leaves it on the on the shore and it leaves it in a line um, and that line um, will um, change depending on what the tide has been doing um, so uh, the strand line is that sort of patch of seaweed but there's also different types of strand line strand line is also seasonal uh, as well so there's a lot of things that sort of die off towards the end of um, the end of the summer and into the winter and a lot of that gets sort of washed in to the strand line as well um, I'm just going to see if anybody else is uh, wanting to join us no um, just somebody I don't recognize um, so um, so yeah so I'll introduce you to, to a, diff a few different types of strand line um, but it isn't just um, just dead seaweed there's all sorts within that seaweed that is fascinating um, lots of treasures lots of signs of life in the sea um, the strand the tide actually comes in for, for those who don't know um, actually if you were if your job was to uh, predict what the tide was doing you'd have to look at 60 different variables um, to to say whether the tide was and how high the tide was going to come in at a certain time so um, and that depends on where you are in, in on the globe whether what sort of um, basin you have that sort of um, your tide your waters walk are coming into um, but also, and the main factor is what the, the moon is up to and the cycle of the moon. So our highest tides are unfortunately named spring tides, not helpful, um, but they're all called spring tides and we have two a month and they're highest and lowest at the same time. And they correspond with low moon, uh, with no moon, um, like a new moon or a full moon. And right now it's perfect actually, we're just about having a full moon, it was either last night or tonight. Um, mm. And so uh, there's a, a bit of a lag, a couple of days later, we'll have our highest and lowest um, tides of this part of the month. And again, we'll have another high and low co corresponding to the, to, the, uh, low, to the new moon. Then we have neap tides in between. And actually, um, a lot of people are thrilled to go and see the beach on the lowest tides because it sort of reveals lots of um, areas of, of, that don't get covered, um, that don't get uncovered a lot and so you can see lots of animal life but actually if you wanted to investigate strand lines um, the best time to go is during a neap so because actually um, the tide has been in higher than lower than lower every day and so you've got several strand lines to investigate okay so um, I'm just going to have another look at the waiting room only because it's telling me that there are people uh, so Gillian Donahue, is there a thumbs up? Can anybody recognize that name? Thumbs up. I'm only seeing four people. Let's see if I can see Jill. Mm -hmm. Gillian Donahue, Mark? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm going to admit. <laughs> okay, um, right, so, uh, so yeah, moving on. Uh, this is also a strand line and actually this isn't seaweed all of this that you can see except for bits of grass and stones and stuff is uh, animal life and it is actually I'm going to show you uh, some of the animal life that you can see if anybody can see me um, this is um, colonies of tiny little animals this is horn rack and this is actually a sea beard there's different species um, of animal life um, in colonies that, that these are hydroids they're called hydroids they're related actually to um, jellyfish and anemones and stuff um, and you won't be able to see I'm sure you can't see mm. that close I don't know what the camera is going to do to that but if you see little things sticking out there um, that is where tiny little polyps um, animals they are animals but they can't live as individuals they have to live with the, within the colony so there are sort of animals in inverted commas um, but these are tiny little polyps that form these colonies 
Um, and then obviously when the colony dies off or gets washed in, um, it, it sort of gets washed up to the, uh, to the, sh up to, on the shore. Um, and actually this, when it's a sandy shore, there's a, actually, you don't find a lot of seaweed on the strand line. You will find this instead. And actually this um, sort of takes the place of seaweed out to sea and a lot of animals would use it to feed on and to hide under and to attach to. So when these land on the shore, a lot of the time they have shells and other things attached to them and they're, they're in a sort of big roll. And this also on other shores, uh, seaweed will do the same. They, they actually sit on the sand and start collecting sand and can actually be the basis of dunes. Now this one, this horn rack, I'll show you, uh, actually, so the, um, this is a hydroid. Uh, this isn't what I'm about to show you, but um, this is an up close of a hydroid. Um, one species, there's lots of different species, like I said. Um, so, and you can see lots of tiny little animals sort of living and, and having different jobs mm. as part of their sort of colonial life. Um, and then this is an up close of this hydroid, uh, horn rack. So this, when I first saw it, I thought it was, it was, you know, some sort of bit of material that had fallen off someone's bubble hat, you know, as a, you know, someone's had a bubble hat with a flower on, uh, but that wasn't the case. It's um, a colony of animals. It starts off um, as a, a sort of a flat patch and some colonies um, of bryozoans, these are, some colonies um, actually just stay as flat patches on bits of seaweed and stuff. So you sometimes you'll see sort of um, bits of seaweed that look like they're coated in sort of brown or greyish stuff. That's um, a, a, um, a sea mat. So, and then some, some of these sea mats uh, then grow into uh, this as a horn rack. So it's not entirely a sea mat. Um, and then you can see on this picture, you can see um, those lines are actually growth lines. So that shows that the animals, you know, grow grown um, more in some parts of the year than, than uh, other parts of the year. Okay, so again, I'm looking into the waiting room. I'm not seeing anybody I recognize. So uh, this is um, the one thing um, that I think all, all of us should know is you should be part of our common knowledge. You know, like we all know that bees pollinate and we learned that in school. Um, what we should know is that crabs to grow, all crustaceans to grow, they have to molt. So this is a shore crab um, and, and the reason I've, I've given you, sent you this blurry picture is because um, this is the shore crab literally seconds later. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 to know that you've got a malt, basically you can um, either sniff it and if it smells revolting, it's a dead crab and don't take it home, whatever you do. But um, mm -hmm. if it's empty, um, then you should, if it's still wet, you should be able to lift the back up like just like a bonnet of a car and see um, nothing inside. This is totally empty except for a few bits of gills. Um, and this is something that we should all know because there are so many people that visit the shore um, year after year and um, they get upset because they see all these upturned dead crabs on the shoreline, especially sort of from now and into the summer. And actually that's not the case. This is signs of growing life, growing populations. Um, actually, because um, once the female has molted, it's only then that she's ready to and receptive to breed. So, um, so as well as sign of an actual growing crab, because the crab will pump itself up, burst out of the back of its shell, come out of all of its its um, sort of legs, pincers, everything, and then turn uh, it. It grows then into a third of the size bigger it's already started making the shell, the new shell from underneath uh, as before it's even uh, come out of the, of the malt. But as it's, um, as it has come out of the malt, it's actually quite soft and it needs to go and hide and harden the shell that it's made. So, because without that hardened shell, it really effectively has no skeleton. Some crabs um, actually will go through their malt uh, quite a few times as they're growing, um, uh, some crab species. Um, and then they will then effectively only molt once a year and that combines with the breeding season. Now some crabs only molt at breeding time and these, uh, this looks like crab armageddon here, this is Dennis Sinclair which is quite close to, this is my beach that I can visit every, every, um, every day on my exercise, um, my COVID-19 exercise. Uh, it doesn't look like this now but I am looking forward to seeing if, it co if this happens again. This is spider crab molts. Um, spider crabs molt at a particular time of the year um, so that it combines, it, it, it sort of corresponds with the females coming into breeding, breeding condition or breeding ability. 
Um, and so all of the, uh, the crabs go from out um, offshore and into sh uh, the shallows a certain time of the year and then breed. This happened all at once, at once. It doesn't always, sometimes it happens over a period of a few weeks. Um, but at this point, um, the, all the, the crab molts had come in at once, which is amazing. Now, some of these animals you will find on the strand line uh, because the males uh, get a bit over amorous and they get a bit caught out by the tide. They're more interested in mating. Uh, so I have seen a few stranded males on the shore. But what you also might find tucked away uh, in the shallower areas um, are um, crabs that are um, basically mate guarding. So this, this is a um, gorgeous crab, but very, very fierce, um, a um, velvet swimming crab. Um, but in Welsh, actually, it's called a uh, crank llogat goch, um, which is a red-eyed crab, which is, both of them are very um, descriptive names, which is lovely, but you can see there's a male on top and underneath, upside down, there's a female. He's keeping hold of the female until she's molted and she's ready to, to um, for him to be basically daddy. Uh, you'll find lots of um, different um, types of eggs as well on the strand line, so well worth uh, investigating. This comes with a warning. Um, it has um, a, a bit of a gruesome horror story to go with it. Uh, this mm. is the egg case of the uh, common whelk, which is our, one of our larger uh, marine snails, absolutely gorgeous. We have a fisheries here, um, which um, uh, people in South Korea eat our common whelks. Um, I have um, um, met people uh, who've eaten a whelk and um, uh, yeah, the, um, they say it's a bit leathery, uh, which is maybe why not so many people, we don't have that much of a, a market here. Um, so the horror story, um, so please uh, hold, hold your ears if you're a bit sensitive, I am, I don't know why I'm telling this all the time, um, is that um, basically when these are babies, um, and you can see the individual little um, sort of packets of, of um, either babies or um, uh, with, with yolk as well, looks like a load of yolk actually unhatched. Um, when they're, so within each sort of section, there are lots of the babies and um, they're feeding on yolk and these get laid probably February time around here. So it's March time that we start getting a flurry of these washed up on the shore once the babies have left. But before they've left, um, some of them are a little bit more ready to leave um, their lovely uh, egg case um, because they fed and, and eaten everything that was in there. And so they come out and start eating their brothers and sisters. So that's a lovely, charming story from the seashore uh, and well worth keeping an eye out for. Um, and then we have uh, mermaid's purses. Um, these are thornback rays. All our skates lay um, egg cases. Um, and there's one individual baby that's grown inside there, um, probably for about six months. Um, they, they get laid in the sort of sand and crevices, um, and the babies are nice and safe in there. These are all soaked, actually, um, and they're soaked for a reason. Um, sometimes you'll see them washed up and they're still wet, but a lot of the time they're really quite dried. They look very much like seaweed. It is in seaweed a lot of the time that you'll find some of the egg cases. Um, but um, these are soaked because of um, a need to want to measure them and um, identify them ready for a shark egg case hunt. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, mention that in a minute. Um, so these are thornback ray um, or morgaf studs uh, in Welsh. Um, and um, yeah, uh, lots of, um, well, all our skates uh, lay eggs. Um, and it's important that we keep an eye on um, how our skates are doing because actually skates are, are not very well protected. Um, in the EU, 50% of, uh, of our skates are actually classed as threatened. Um, and actually, we've already lost one skate species from Wales. Uh, we used to have common skates, the, uh, the, the largest skate in the world, actually, um, and massive egg cases as well. Now they have them in Scotland. We don't have them here. We, they were overfished. So um, it would be good to keep an eye on our skates and our, um, our true sharks. Uh, there's only a couple that lay eggs uh, in our waters. Our waters actually um, have 50 species of shark either visiting or living here, uh, including skates. There's obviously the wider sense of sharks. Um, and angel shark. We have angel sharks living in Cardigan Bay and North Anglesey, possibly, you know, if they do well, maybe they'll come around to the North Coast as well, which would be fantastic. 
Um, this is a true um, true shark egg case, uh, and you yeah, can see the difference yeah, is instead of having um, horns, um, this has tendrils, and so it lays uh, its eggs in a different way. This um, lays eggs um, in, within seaweed. Sometimes, actually, um, they lay eggs um, in um, uh, uh, and wrap it round. Um, um, sponge species so this is actually these are called mermaid's purses obviously this is a different species as the nurse hound um and mermaid this is a mermaid's purse attached to a mermaid's glove which is a species of sponge so um so which i i love but sometimes they'll they'll wrap around most of the time it's uh, wrap around seaweed um and then the baby here this is a, a small spotted cat shark um, baby and that lives uh, inside there eating and growing um eating its yolk and growing uh, for about six months as well. The species I've just showed you is a nurse hound and that can be up to 10 months. Um, so yeah, they're, they're slow growing sharks, all sharks are slow growing, they're, they're um, pretty slow before they start breeding. So actually they're not helping themselves in terms of conservation and then we're not helping them either. So the more, the bigger for sharks, the better. Uh, this is the egg case hunt. So this is something if you can reach your beach um, locally, um, then, you know, please have a think about it. Collect egg cases, take them home, soak them, and then you can use a Shark Trust website to um, help you identify them and then report them. So, uh, and that can all help. Uh, that's the Citizen Science, lovely Citizen Science project. Uh, it could all help with... Um, with uh, um, I've got a couple more people waiting in there, it looks like. Um, no, can't see them. Um, so it can all help with uh, shark conservation, which is uh, no bad thing. Um, okay, so then a lot of the time um, you'll find some, you know, a few strange items. These don't last long, they're incredibly fragile. Um, if I was holding one and sneezed, that'd be it. Um, and we obviously we have this strand line on tour, which when we're out and about, we take uh, and stick. Uh, well, like uh, Mark and Jill do, they they show you they have they've collected parts of the strand line and they show you that when they're doing beach cleans and stuff. Um, and so we do, and these never last. So uh, luckily, there's plenty of them on the shore that we can help ourselves to. So that's good. Um, these are sea potatoes. They're also called heart urchins. Um, and they, if they, um, if they, if they're fairly fresh, um, what you'll find is them um, coming up onto the strand line with spines all over. They're totally coated in spines when they're living, and they live in the sand. Um, and as you can see, um, urchins. Um, what, looking at the pattern on this is a very handy uh, reminder that urchins are related to starfish. You can see the the little star on the back of these. Um, okay. Uh, and then we move on to, um, well, we'll probably go back to the to the sort of the seaweedy strand line. But in the meantime, there are other strand lines you can introduce yourself to, especially if your, your beach has a lot of sand and it has like a gradient um, or little bits of rivulets and stuff. A lot of that can can sort of um, keep hold of some of the things that the water's carrying, including this shelly strand line. So a lot of the time in the wetter areas of sand, you'll find a bit of a shelly strand line. Um, and it has all sorts of gorgeous shells on it. Um, this is a lovely whole uh, scallop that um, we found. It obviously wasn't living, but it was um, fairly whole. Um, I can hear clanking, so if anybody's got their audio on, please um, be aware that we're all hearing clanking, I think, at the moment. Um, and then um, sometimes you can find some really intriguing different types of shells on this sort of strand line. So it's very definitely well worth going for an inspection and especially with children and a lot of the time what you can find is lots of miniature versions of bigger shells as well because they look they just look absolutely intriguing so um, and obviously there's loads of cowries there's loads of um, this is uh, there's an acti in there um, and you can find sort of sting winkles and wankle traps pelican shells all sorts of lovely shells um, so well worth investigating and it's again you'll just find lots of uh, unusual sort of things that you didn't know were just living just offshore uh, oh dear I'll go back. so um this is sometimes what you can find on that shelly strand line it's sort of amalgamations of like like i said miniature shells so those those little razor shells are actually probably only about that big which and we all know razor shells can be pretty huge so these are small versions of the of the razor shells but then in amongst all that you can find you can see uh, there's little um, sand mason cases and also trumpet worm cases. 
So the sand mason and the trumpet worm, both of them are worms which make um, like a, a little sort of um, a safety burrow, I suppose, out of um, bits of sand. The sand mason does it in a different way. It has some sort of like twangy sock that it decorates with big bits of sand, which you can see there. The twangy sock is the thing that's sort of a bit bent. The thing that looks like a cornetto um, is actually the trumpet worm. And they make absolutely, and this is, this is a recent find. I've just found this on the beach about three days ago and had a close up look. You can see just how delicate the, um, well, it, uh, you could call that a tiling or um, building work on that. It's absolutely amazing. The trumpet worm lives inside and then in the sand. So sometimes you can find these. If you're close enough, and lucky enough, sometimes you can find, um, going back to crustacean molts, sometimes you can find small crab molts, but also prawn molts. And they're just see-through and they're just the back end of a prawn, but it's absolutely amazing. Really lovely to find. Well worth investigating. More eggs, especially this time of year, can be found. Can be found on the strand line. Um, Doc, can, you, can I just can I, go on? Doc, can you hear me? Can you I hear can me? hear Mark, yes. Can, can I just interrupt a second and just can I just to say to people, uh, cause for them not to interrupt your talk, if anybody, everybody can hear me hopefully, if they can on the bottom left hand corner of the screen, mute themselves and turn the video off, then any movement won't be seen by them and they won't be heard and maybe we can turn that on when we come to the questions. Does that make sense? Did everybody hear that? Mm. Yes. Um, Sometimes they need to move no, no. their mouse so that they can move, see the... Move the mouse to the bottom of the screen and it'll show mute and stop video. If you can mute and stop video, then you'll just see Dawn and her screen. Okay? Then, then any movements or any speech on it that you do at home won't come through straight away and interrupt. Okay, we're still learning this technology. <laughs> we're all in the process of kind of like getting, getting our head around this. And it's great that people can do this. But if, if that's possible, I'm going to do I think he might have said he was going to do that himself and he did it in the middle of that sentence. So um, I think what you need to do is move your mouse so that the, um, the band of options comes up. You won't see it until you've moved your mouse. So, um, and then there's a little microphone and a little video that you can click on and it, it, it will mute you and get rid of your video as well. So, um, so yeah, so sometimes on the strand line, on the wetter strand line, you'll find um, this time of year, you'll find some eggs because it is, it's spring, even though spring is much more obvious on land, in the sea, especially in the intertidal, there's a lot of stuff going on in springtime. Um, it's a, a slightly wider spring, I'd say, probably from maybe, um, February time all the way through until middle of summer. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, but yeah, lots of lots of um, signs of life um, definitely in um, in uh, uh, right now um, are signs of breeding life. So uh, what we've got here is um, a, a sort of an, another egg case basically. Um, this one was made by um, a shell um, which is we think named after the shape of this egg case. So the, the name of the shell is a necklace shell, and it's actually the, the, one of the shells on the sandy shore that goes around drilling holes into other animals. And um, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and eat, that's how it eats, it predates on other animals. Um, but the necklace shell, we think, is actually named um, necklace shell because of this, because it looks like um, the, um, the Welsh or the, the Celtic sort of um, metal uh, warrior collar, um, which is called torch. Um, in Welsh and this the name of the shell in Welsh is Kragen Dorch so um, that's what we're going with but there's lots of other reasons why people say that necklace shell is called the necklace shell including you can make a necklace out of the the holes that it makes in other shells but anyway um, so this is yeah another animal I think I've got a picture of some of the and the the holes are really amazing um, so they they drill straight through they use a little bit of chemical as well but they have this sort of radula like a lot of our marine snails have which is uh, loads of tiny teeth on it on this sort of band of muscle and it uh, will then sort of use that to sort of sort of drill into the shell um, using a bit of chemical to start off with uh, and the necklace shell is that big sort of brownish sort of um, apricotty type shell 
on the left it's a bit battered but um you get you get the, the gist they're actually not especially common um to be found on the shore considering how many shells you can find with uh, with holes in that's another exciting thing to do with the children is find shells with holes in and signs of uh, the driller killer at large um and then although they don't stick to the strand line um especially since you're down looking at the wet strand line also this time of year and and, and beyond maybe another month actually um we'll start seeing a lot of jellyfish on the str uh, strand line now even though we have barrel jellies which are the massive they're either called barrel jellies or football uh, jellies or dustbin lid jellies which gives you an idea of just how big they are um they come through all the year round uh, really so uh, that's what we've noticed anyway anecdotal evidence but um this uh, the the uh, the three usual jellies that we see in the summer tend to come at particular times in certain summers anyway we've seen a bank bank university has shown this as well um that we start off with a moon jelly um initially <clears throat> and then um um and then we've got um um <clears throat> excuse me a uh, sorry i've just uh, introduced somebody else to the waiter room someone called sheila so hopefully she does fine sheila sheila's iphone um so we start with the moon jelly so they they turn up and they're sm small jellies with pink um sections in the middle um and then we head to um the season i suppose sort of late june into july where we have um compass jellies now this is i have to say probably the most beautiful compass jelly i've ever seen they don't always look like this a lot of them lose their color sometimes you'll see those little dark bands all the way around and that's it you don't see this this sort of marking but obviously you can see that it's it's sort of you could see the reason why it's called the compass jelly um absolutely beautiful and they do come in um again on mass with the because basically they're they're their numbers increase uh, at this time of year and then also this is the time of year we get all our a lot of warm water coming up from um, from the Atlantic uh, and then we get this is a really rubbish picture because it's taken at night we did nighttime rock pooling and saw this on the shore but a lion's mane jelly in fact the majority of jellies look so much better in the water than on land um, so but this in particular is looks absolutely spectacular in the water a lot of the time they're huge um, and they're just they've just got this mass of tentacles that are all red and it just looks like a lion's mane it's absolutely beautiful um, and uh, these and the, the barrel jelly are the two jellies that are the the, uh, the jellies that sort of bringing in a lot of our um, turtles especially the leatherback turtles they come in following um the jelly uh, the jellyfish so um even though a lot of people don't appreciate seeing the jellies on the shore uh, it's actually bringing some exciting wildlife in after it because they feed on the, on the on the jellies which is lovely uh then we get a lot of in fact actually on the north coast str um, strand line <clears throat> in particular um you do get a lot of washed up um uh, starfish especially um common stars like these um <coughs> and these are the reason i <coughs> excuse me i'm focusing on the common star is because um they're you know they're, they're a great actually i've got one and i've literally just found one on um, on the shore here uh, and i have brought it it's a weeny one you can see but it's well dried never take a jelly unless it's well dried off the shore because you will regret it totally um you know even, probably even your neighbors would smell it if you've left it outside so i wouldn't do um but for our strand line on tour they're amazing because you can point out the various parts of the of the um the starfish that are quite remarkable so for a start um with a common star you've got five arms they're not legs they're arms underneath you can still still see on that picture there's a few frilly bits it looks like there it's tube feet and they actually move by um sort of filling and unfilling with water um and the, the water is actually seawater which comes in through the starfish from the surface um and it fills a lot of the canals within the starfish as well so it moves using those tube feet not the arms um and then it feeds in a really gruesome way so again if you're you know not wanting a horror story on a friday night then um hide your ears um because um this the, the common star even though actually it does get caught out a lot on sandy shores it uh, tends to feed a lot on um rocky shore species such as mussels and limpets now both those species either they have two shells which they clamp shut very effectively 
um, or they're, they're, if they're limpet, they'll cling to the rock and really clamp. They've got a very powerful foot. So the starfish have a battle initially to open up the shell or prise the shell away from the, from the, um, from the rock. And then once there's a gap, the starfish will take its stomach out of itself, stick it in the gap, digest the animal, and then bring its stomach back and head off and go and look for another food, another bit of food. And starfish have this legendary ability to regenerate, and it can actually regenerate its stomach afresh if it was disturbed mid-meal and had to leave its stomach in place. So, um, yeah, really quite remarkable animals. It can regrow pretty much um, any part of its body as well. And, and from quite tiny sort of, uh, you know, not much really um, left. So yeah, quite amazing animals. Um, their eyes as well are on the tips of their arms. Um, so that's quite exciting. So it can see round corners, which is handy. Um, and then these are sand stars. Again, you will um, find these on the North Coast, got caught out really. Um, so these live within the sand. And they, what they do is their arms, they'll, they'll live within the sand and then they'll sort of push their arms sort of close to the surface of the sand just to sort of keep an eye out on what's going on, a bit nosy. Um, and then we have, um, these are brittle stars. Now this, uh, this is actually us rescuing some brittle stars which got caught out. Again, they're regular, they regularly do get caught out. And you do just pay attention a little bit more to the strand line and you'll see there's an awful lot of um, creatures that are getting caught out and maybe you can help um, these, probably um, you can. Although they can help themselves, I'll show you a, a video actually as I'm talking. Uh, this is our wild coast, uh, we, we were at Bentley, um and um, we found these and sort of put them back in some little um, rock pools. But this, we shared this on the uh, Northwest Wildlife Trust Facebook page. Um, and uh, it had over 10,000 views and people saying, oh my God, it's an alien. And you know, they've never seen anything like it. As you can see, though, this starfish uses its arms to move, not its feet. So, um, but they are pretty, pretty strange creatures. But recently, um, I filled a bucket full um, on uh, Ross on Sea and uh, Colwyn Bay, actually. Colwyn Bay, um, just recently, because um, I happened to go to Colwyn Bay on the way to another event in March. Um, excuse me, to uh, before all this happened, um, to fetch some seawater because I needed some seawater for soaking. So um, yeah, so I found a few and uh, you know put them back where they needed to be. But sometimes mm -hmm. actually the strand line um, just, well the sea just chucks everything that's living in it, in the sand anyway, on the strand line. Um, and in particular, we're, we're actually, that's another citizen science project that you can help with, which is called Beached. You can find it on Covnard or the Northwest Wildlife Trust page. Um, and it's, um, it's basically documenting when you see things like this. I mean, this is quite a remarkable one. It's, it's a, you know, one in a 10, 20, 30 year experience. Nobody would seen this um, happen quite in the scale that it did. Uh, um, this happened a couple of years ago at Sandona on Anglesey. Um, and it was after a, um, a cold snap and stormy weather and it brought everything up on the shore. Now, even though, yes, it's not, it's not as ideal to see lots of dead and dying stuff on the shore, it is fascinating because you do get the chance to see some of these things that you didn't even know lived in the strand line, uh, lived in the sand, or you do know, but you just don't get to, to see it much. So, um, so these are otter shells, which are pretty, you know, they're decent sized shells. Um, and those things that are sticking out uh, that look very fleshy are its siphon. So that's how it feeds and it lives within the sand. Um, and yeah, these, these were still feeding thousands and thousands of gulls four, five, six days later when people were doing bird counts and stuff. So it was quite amazing. And within this, there were lots of other creatures um, very connected with Sandy Shore. And again, creatures that you don't often find um, were within this. So it was really quite fascinating find and one of the creatures <coughs> excuse me um is was a sea mouse now this is called a sea mouse it's actually its scientific name is named after the greek goddess of of love um and it, but it's actually a worm so and it's covered in these tiny iridescent little hairs um and those iridescent hairs are actually um helping to inform researchers um who are trying to um improve the uh, the makeup I suppose or the, the the power of fiber optic cables 
because basically when researchers found um, sea mice hairs, they found that um, the light information that goes from one end to the other doesn't really get lost very much. It's 99% efficient, whereas our fiber optic cables were in the 80s efficient. So um, yeah, and biomimetics, um, <coughs> excuse me, which is what that um, activity, I suppose, is called, where researchers look to nature to um, help with design. Um, has been shown a, a lot of um, biomimetics looks to the sea because there's an awful lot going on in the sea that helps with streamlining um, and um, grabbing. Uh, the Mars rover apparently was um, um, its grabber where it grabs um, samples um, was based on the uh, Aphrodite's lantern which is the feeding part of an urchin. Um, and there's all sorts of other stuff, including shark skins in the Olympics, which are banned and everything. So yeah, quite a, quite a lot has come from our scene, not just um, food. Uh, and then we have noodles. Um, I have my noodles here. <coughs> I've had to start on a, a bigger jar, and this is only noodles that I've sort of been um, been collecting recently. These are a sad sight to see. They're actually called mermaid's tears. Um, so these are tiny bits of plastic which we don't want to be seeing on the shore but unfortunately what's even worse about noodles is that these haven't even been a product yet these are microplastics which are either um, on the way to processing or have been lost from a processing plant um, and they're uh, they've been um sort of lost um, either off a container or through um, loss within the, the processing plant and have been sort of, you know, gone straight into the wastewater treatment system or, or a stormwater more likely um, and um, headed out to sea. And these are all very edible. Um, they're they're microplastics, so they're, you know, they're the size that can be eaten. Um, and yet they haven't even been sort of a plastic item. All our plastic items start off as these, as these sort of tiny microplastics and they get melted into whatever shape plastic that we need. Um, and it does point to the need for us to rethink how we use plastic. Plastic is vital in our lives right now. We're not saying plastic isn't important, but the way that we use single use plastic especially needs to change. And so please, next time you go to the shop, if you can, even in lockdown, have a rethink about um, what what you're buying and try and try and go for something that isn't um isn't coated in microplastics um so these we do noodle hunts that's another uh, citizen science pointer so we do noodle hunts we use um pots and tweezers so this is our beach clean our beach clean um doing noodle microplastic beach clean uses uh, um minuscule um stuff stuff in the mini because it is mini that we're picking up uh, we also use sieves sometimes as well uh, and then we tell the great noodle hunt um or yeah i think it's called the great noodle hunt um which are a scottish organization that have now produced this global noodle hunt and you can map it as well um and then this um for any anyone who has children in their lives please pass this on because i think children love this idea and it, this is how word of mouth is going to happen um, this is a, an earbud. You can see that it's it's um, an earbud because of the little notches on the end. It's a bit of a blurred picture. Um, and it was found, as we always find them, uh, together with uh, all sorts of other sanitary stuff and um, now nowadays uh, wet wipes. Uh, we find them on our beach cleans. Um, <clears throat> it's ubiquitous. They're always there and they're coming down through people's toilets, basically through the sewage system. So what we'd like to spread uh, during this lockdown is um, the, um, the importance of only um, three P's going down the toilet. Um, and yes, you, you can now say this in front of their parents. I'm sure nobody would be uh, too upset. Um, only poo, pee and paper go down the toilet. That's it. Three P's, nothing more. Um, sometimes people have pointed out plastic begins with a P. It does. You're right. That's the one P that doesn't go down the toilet, a major pee that doesn't go down the toilet. Um, and you, I think someone else also mentioned puke, which is not great, but I'm going to move on. That's another pee, and I suppose you're allowed that. 
Um, okay, so stormy strand lines also, I and mean, when we're talking about plastic, but sometimes plastic can be treasure as well. It can be something that intrigues people enough to go beach combing and to pick up um, plastic items in case they find a treasure. And one of the treasures um, that you can find, especially after stormy weather, um, sort of uh, like wintry weather that comes in, um, is um, this, my just my most amazing find. Um, now this, I found at Dennis Den Fair, my local beach, um, in 2016, um, and it's from um, the um, storm dumped um, Lego set disaster that happened um, in South Devon in 1997. Um, a, a Lego set, well, several thousand Lego sets, which ironically were some sort of like marine research lab um, type set. Um, all were lost at sea um, during a storm when um, they were being transported from The Hague, I think, to New York. Um, and um, so people started finding them in South Devon, all over the beaches, lots of different things um, found as well as the, the Lego pieces. Uh, and so they started documenting them and found that the Lego pieces were being found in Cornwall and then North Coast. And we found them here now as well. So um, like I said, this Sea, this is seagrass from that dive set. Um, so, and um, you can see that it's pretty in pretty good condition, even if it's just, even if it uh, travelled, you know, around the coast fairly quickly and has been in situ for a while. That's, you know, still nearly twenty years. It's been in the environment. And it hasn't even lost its colour. So, this is the the pervasive sort of problem of plastics in our environment. Um, and we've since found, so this is definitely treasure that's still being found. Because only a couple of years ago, we were doing a snoodling event, which is snorkeling and um, doing art underwater. Um, and one of our Living Seas champions very nicely donated this to us, um, also donated. So this is the this is the seagrass, and this is one of the divers' aqualum. We found that on the north coast of the Sheen. So I don't know whether you can see that. So that's the uh, Lego set and Divers Aqualung. Uh, on the same day, somebody else found um, a life jacket, a yellow life jacket as part of the set as well. So uh, they're still being sat, uh, found. Um, so also there's the famous story of the rubber ducks. I don't know whether they're still being found, but um, I think in the 2000s they were still in being found. So definitely well worth uh, looking at. Um, and then natural litter as well. So this is actually um, a sea bean it's, it's a, a, a seed from a tropical vine uh, which grows in the Caribbean um, and then um, it's designed actually to be seaworthy so to go from island to island to disperse and then regenerate. Um, this one and clearly several others have basically missed every single island of the Caribbean headed all the way up the east coast which is where our water comes from the east coast of the US all the way up to Canada and then across um, we also get um, lobster pot tags from Canada. Uh, we know um, that are from Canada because it's got, in fact, all the information that you would need to actually um, pinpoint the person that put the lobster, ta uh, lobster tag in the water and the date and stuff. And a lot of them are, are 20 years old. So definitely well worth, well worth um, looking out for um, wintry finds, definitely. But there's all sorts of other uh, very exciting stuff. Um, this is um, your, um, if you didn't know already, this is your Combi Valley branch um, uh, secretaries and uh, chair and also um, Charlotte who this is, our, I think this might have been our first beach clean that we did and Charlotte um, came as a volunteer and is now working for the Trust as uh, one of our project officers which is lovely. Um, so uh, yeah, Conway Valley Branch, um, when they can get out there, I'm quite sure they will organise another beach clean. They have been doing beach watch cleans in uh, Colwyn Bay for a couple of years. They've done major cleans in San Dipno as well. Um, and I think probably Mark will uh, reintroduce us to what's going on, I think back in Colwyn Bay. Uh, but well worth, while you're, if you're able to get to the beach, definitely take a bag with you and just do a mini clean because, you know, not enough people are out there doing that now. Um, and yes so also we're coming up to 30 days wild please um do get involved um, you just need to click onto the the north world wildlife pay, uh, facebook page i think it's on the front page um click on and register um and then um, you'll get lots of ideas and pointers um to what to do ideas to what to do for every single day in june that um you can do something for nature or get out in nature and um and just have everybody 
Um, so, and also, yes, do be aware um, that um, our Wildlife Trust is a charity and at the moment charities need all our help. So please, if you, you're already a member, maybe have a think about uh, somebody else becoming a member as well um, and do a gift membership maybe or, you know, donate or volunteer if you can uh, and let us know what you're finding on the strand lines. That will be absolutely fantastic. I'm going to end here. I have got more strand lines to introduce if anybody's got 